Okay, so my name is Joey Balant. Uh, today's topic is going to be covering some trivial vulnerabilities that we're still seeing uh, today in a lot of environments. I will kind of be stepping back from your standard uh, new tool, latest threat type of talk and kind of looking back at uh, some old vulnerabilities as well as things that pretty much just go against your basic standard security 101 practices and still exist today. <clears throat> um, my name is Joe Glanz. I'm with uh, Efficient Security. I've been with consult with them for about a year now. Prior to that, I was uh, mostly on the consultant, or excuse me, mostly on the corporate side. Um, kind of main reason I made the switch was to try to get more uh, more exposed to what's out there uh, rather than just dealing with a single network um, and being limited in what I could do with that network. Uh, the other half of me uh, has been a passion of mine for a while. If it wasn't IT, it'd probably be hopefully or potentially have been a DJ somewhere. I uh, still try to do as much today as I can. Uh, hoping to maybe be a DEF CON if you guys make it out there. Maybe have a chance to see me out in Vegas. So the, ultimately, the problem that I'm trying to solve with this talk is kind of twofold. Uh, one, from a, uh, if you're a security professional maintaining an environment, try to bring to light some common vulnerabilities um, that still exist today that really make my job very easy to do. Um, the other side of it would be from a pen tester standpoint, making sure that things that look uh, uh, low or medium or not necessarily a risk in and of themselves try to bring them to light uh, to make sure they don't get overlooked when you're doing an assessment. So really the overall arching problem, uh, I believe, is hackers have a lot of spare time. Uh, they've got an uh, enormous amount of resources in front of them in the sense of the amount of data that's available out on the internet, things that they can get from services, what have you. They've, uh, once they review that information, really all they need to do is find one weak leak into an environment where the security guy pretty much has to maintain not only the technical side of the environment, but also <coughs> dealing with your standard compliancy issues and your assessments and dealing with the developer who's telling you you're a roadblock for him getting his application done. Um, really, you're already overworked. You don't have time to, to really deal with all this. And at the end of the day, you're kind of fighting a losing battle. Um, you just don't have the amount of time that an attacker's going to have. So what I'm hoping to uh, at least help today is at least the basic stuff. Again, try to take what you already do on a day-to-day -day basis and um, kind of bring to light some things that we're still seeing as consultants uh, that really just shouldn't be there anymore. And if anything else, um, you as a professional, make your site less of a target. Um, at least if somebody like myself is, is assessing your network, um, or an attacker uh, is going to make an attempt on your network, then you're going to at least make their job a little harder. And when all is said and done, you're going to be secure, right? Well, obviously not, but again, hopefully you'll, you'll be less of a target. Uh, so the vulnerabilities, I'll be introducing just some basic vulnerabilities that we uh, continue to see in environments. I'll describe the associated risks with them, uh, some discovery examples, uh, some real world uh, screenshots of things that we've seen and engagements that we've conducted. Uh, time permitting, I will go through a case study that kind of pulls us all together uh, and then I'll uh, open it up for, uh, for some discussion. So Security 101, these are basic principles that every security practitioner obviously needs to follow. They are written in every standard, every best practice, every compliancy document but yet everything that I'm gonna be mentioning today pretty much goes against these basic principles. Uh, I have to say, I was pretty naive when I, when I took this job. Uh, I was expecting to find that my job was gonna be a lot harder than it was in the sense of it would be more complex, more uh, that many of these basic principles wouldn't be as rampant as they are. Uh, so for myself, being new to the consulting side, it was actually very eye-opening for me. So we'll start with information disclosure. Uh, obviously, in and of itself, may not necessarily lead to an immediate compromise, but enough, if you divulge enough information to an attacker, um, give them enough vectors, they might be able to piece together a lot of that information together, 
to perform future attacks. Uh, some of the areas that I'm going to be talking about are uh, application design flaws. These would be anywhere, your, your standard uh, web application, if it's got a database back end. Um, uh, if you divulge the database that exists behind it, uh, standard error message you might reveal to an attacker. Uh, if he's able to break that application, how he can go about, uh, basically what techniques he can now use to attack that database. Clear text protocol, self-explanatory. Um, they still exist today. People are still using Telnet, still using FTP uh, for various, uh, various reasons. Um, obvious risk, any of that, anything that traverses those protocols is going to be available, potentially available to an attacker. Uh, default configurations. Um, easy example is Tomcat. We still, to this day, find Tomcat all over the place uh, with a default configuration, which typically is going to either be no password in place or uh, in a situation where you can bypass the authentication. Uh, null sessions, very apparent in misconfigured Active Directory environments. Uh, in cases where we find this, uh, you will potentially be able to pull the, uh, all the users in that, uh, within that Active Directory environment. Um, and obviously once, once you've got that listing, you can now kind of more of a numbers game. Uh, attempt to try to find any of the weak accounts that exist within that environment, which might now give you a foothold into the environment. And the internet. Um, in some cases, you might be able to find enough information about an environment before you even send a single packet to that environment. Uh, there's enough between Google indexing, uh, some of the tools that use the open source information that's available out there. Uh, you may in some ways be able to find pretty much a way to get into an environment before you ever send them a single packet. So some ways to identify some of this stuff. Uh, your standard vulnerability scanners and MAP uh, obviously will do a good job of, of finding a lot of these scenarios. Uh, configuration management software uh, will help with anomalies. Uh, if you've got your golden build in your environment and wanna try to do, identify some of the places where you've taken the time to eliminate your default configurations, this can help identify uh, uh, anomalies in your environment. Uh, manual testing, we find passwords and source code all the time, uh, scripts that we might find that were used to tie things together, whatever, what have you, um, embedded passwords that might get us access into a database or other resources within the environment. Uh, simple browsing, uh, just kind of think outside the box. If you just go beyond the standard port 80, port 443, um, look at some of the other services you might have running in your environment, you may find that they're exposing services or other information that you just didn't know was there based on your standard port 80 and port 443 uh, vulnerability scans. And again, Google, Pastebin, pick your poison. Uh, the information's out there. Um, you may want to just take some time to, as a security professional, just see what, what has Google indexed. What, what, what's out there regarding my environment? So I tried to, uh, the screenshots I'm going through, I tried to arrange them in such a way that an attacker might think um, as they were to assess an environment. So just doing some simple Google scans. Um, this first example is uh, looking for some password files. Um, I've actually uh, I've come across scenarios myself where I was able to either look in, like on Pastebin, found somebody's Yahoo or LinkedIn, what have you, account was had been, uh, 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 their password had been leaked online, just so happened that same password worked in the corporate environment. Uh, so you might be able to find some information there. Um, backup files. Uh, so this example shows some uh, password, backup password files that existed out on the, out on the, out on the web. Uh, if I can gain those hashes and it just so happens to be a client that I'm assessing, uh, it might give me access to additional resources if I can crack those hashes. Uh, iOS backups, uh, again, if, uh, by downloading some of these images might give me enough information about an environment or better yet, if I can get the hashes out of that backup file, might give me access to perimeter resources uh, that exist in an environment. Who is information? Uh, great for uh, social awareness 
uh, types of tax. Uh, a lot of times you can find full contact information regarding an employee within the company, um, and that employee very well might have elevated resources within the company um, using your standard social engineering type techniques might be able to uh, convince a help desk person to change that password and now give me a foothold into the network. DNS zone transfers, uh, specifically this particular one is a perimeter device. Uh, so not only now uh, could I now have a mapping of the perimeter network, uh, potentially of hosts that I didn't know exist based on other means, um, but even more so if it just so happened that this DNS device had internal information. I now might be able to map the internal network. Again, things that just should not be out there and we're still seeing today. Uh, standard Apache messages. Um, give <coughs> pretty basic, give the version information, but now at least tells me what type of system I'm running. Um, probably low key, but again, just more information to attack or then. Uh, we should be putting out there. Uh, ASP message, uh, key piece here, the uh, root path. Uh, if Now that I know what the root path is of the web server, if I'm able to break this web server um, and ultimately upload a some type of exploit, I now know where that exploit is. I don't have to brute force my way. You're, uh, you're basically minimizing the amount of time it's gonna take for that user to go from the discovery of this vulnerability to the exploitation of it. Printers, uh, many cases people look at vulnerability scans and they say it's just a printer. Well, <clears throat> not only could it potentially have a foothold into the network, but any data that's been printed, copied, faxed, what have you, uh, might be cached on that printer and now you've potentially exposed it to an attacker. This one was a little, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Null sessions. Um, uh, again, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, misconfigured Active Directory environment. Uh, showing the full information regarding a user that was uh, pulled from the Active Directory environment without credentials. Uh, I'm guessing the, uh, the assessor probably had a full listing of accounts that was in Active Directory. And again, at that point, it's a numbers game. Just try to find a weak account. Uh, this one was a little unique. Uh, this was a Java application that just so happened the, um, when you access the site, it downloaded a configuration file down to the applet, which told it where to connect. Um, it was base64 encoded. Um, obviously, uh, very easy to manipulate. Um, you could pretty much tell the client to connect anywhere you wanted to. So if an attacker was able to uh, somehow uh, change that config file, they could ultimately perform a man in the middle attack. Um, maybe if they learn the protocol of the environment or the application, they could ultimately hijack the browser, what have you. Insecure coding. So the three areas I'm gonna talk about have, or at least two of the three have been in the limelight for quite some time. Uh, Cross-site scripting, SQL injection, OWASP top 10 forever, um, but yet still exist in a lot of environments today. Uh, from a risk standpoint, obviously cross-site scripting, not necessarily a risk to the server itself, but uh, more so to your employees, your customers, your clients, what have you. Um, SQL injection can range anywhere from data leakage to a uh, full system compromise, uh, depending on the nature of, the, uh, of how deep the, the backend database or, or how big the exploit really is. Uh, and user enumeration. Uh, at least personal experience, I don't know if this one's actually talked about much, but I found myself, it seems to be quite evident in a lot of, a, a lot of environments. Um, a lot of companies are now moving towards uh, account management or pushing account management out to the end user or their customers so they can maintain it themselves. As such, a lot of that functionality ends up giving attackers or somebody like myself the ability to identify accounts that exist within that, within that environment. And again, it's now a numbers game. <clears throat> From a discovery standpoint, uh, you've got your standard vault scan or doing, um, I would say, a better job of finding some of this stuff. Uh, you've got your more in tune application vulnerability scanners that can help uh, identify a little more in tune to these types of vulnerabilities. Um, your uh, standard web analysis proxy, uh, like for example, Burp has got a lot of the um, 
functionality built in to where it can do some automated testing for you. Um, from a manual standpoint, obviously, uh, Burp again, uh, you can, uh, is, is a uh, good tool to use if you want to just do some manual analysis of your applications. Uh, source code review, uh, probably the best way to find a lot of these flaws. And then there's numerous security and or numerous specialty and custom scripts that people have written that can uh, help identify and or exploit a lot of these types of vulnerabilities. So a quick example, uh, invalid redirect. Uh, this was an application that was identified that uh, had a URL parameter uh, as that you could pretty much pass anything you wanted to and when you made a request to the server, it would ultimately redirect you to that URL. So the example here showing uh, that it was redirected to Google, great for a social engineering attack. Uh, if an attacker would potentially send an email to a bunch of employees uh, using this, this, uh, this vulnerability, uh, and, and uh, an end user might look at it and say this is a valid URL, therefore it's safe to click, and not realizing that it, the server itself is going to ultimately redirect them somewhere else. SQL injection, uh, these three error messages were used to pretty much uh, identify the backend query that was uh, being conducted by the application. Uh, by using the error messages that were provided, uh, the assessor was able to identify the number of columns that were in the query, the types of the type of each column within the query, and pretty much doing a simple union select and now have access to any of the data that existed in that database that was accessible by the user that the application was running as. Uh, user enumeration, uh, it might be kind of hard to read, but ultimately what you see here is uh, two error messages that were uh, provided by a password, or excuse me, by a login screen. Uh, if you submitted a valid account, uh, it would tell you invalid password. If you submitted an invalid account, it would tell you an invalid, invalid user account was provided. Uh, again, you can now lose, loop through just a list of potential accounts, find some valid accounts within the application, and uh, ultimately now try to find any weak passwords associated. Outdated software. Most companies do a pretty good job of keeping up with the standard Microsoft patches. Uh, it's that ancillary stuff that commonly gets missed, um, or your environment has scenarios where that machine just can't be patched because we don't know if it's going to come back up, or uh, it's running an old piece of software, and we patch it, it may not work anymore. Um, these are going to prevent potentially provide uh, assessors and or attackers a foothold in the network. Uh, some standard ways to identify a lot of this stuff. Um, standard NMAP vulnerability scans, um, patch management software will definitely uh, help you identify or at least doing a better job of identifying some of the ancillary stuff that exists outside of Microsoft. Uh, configuration management software can help you from a golden build standpoint, uh, try to identify any anomalies that might exist in the environment. Uh, from a manual standpoint, Netcat, just uh, connect directly to any service. Uh, look at the versioning information that you might get back from it. Um, and from there you can identify, it. is there any known vulnerabilities? Is it out of date? Um, and then these next remaining tools are pretty much gonna identify any open source information that's available out there that uh, may that's been indexed or may provide you information about the services that are running in your environment. MSO8067, uh, it's been around forever. It's very easy to exploit, but yet it still seems to exist in environments today. Um, best part about it, you can exploit it any number of times you want. It really will have no effect on the system that's affected and our system is vulnerable, as well as it's going to give you system level access to the box. Uh, five year vuln that still exists today. Uh, this is an example of a, a TFTP application that had a directory traversal flaw. Uh, ultimately, was able to pull the system SAM and security files. Uh, at this point, you can grab the hashes associated with that box. Um, more than likely, the uh, in many cases, the uh, administrator password, if uh, will 
a lot of cases, the administrator password is reused across the environment, um, so therefore could potentially give access to other resources in the environment. Java, um, pretty much the standard banner when you access a Java applet is really the only thing keeping an end user from potentially causing uh, or keeping an potentially keeping an attacker from exploiting something on the, uh, on the end user's workstation. I actually did a uh, scenario where I sent out an email regarding a security awareness survey. Um, and in the, when you access the survey, it had a job applet embedded and half the recipients answered the survey and gave me access to half the, uh, gave me access to the workstations of half the recipients that received the email. Excessive access. These would be areas that, um, if identified, can quickly and easily give an assessor and attacker uh, a, a lot of access to an environment um, with pretty much less or, or uh, with pretty much minimal or no effort. Uh, publicly exposed authentication interfaces. These would be consoles that uh, would typically be held to, or typically should be. Uh, limited to just local land traffic, um, like Telnet, SSH, uh, any Tomcat consoles, things that just really don't need to be on the perimeter, but yet we're still finding them today. Uh, very easy to exploit. Uh, default configuration, so SNMP public seems still to be rampant uh, on the internet today. Uh, local admin rights, many organizations still give their end users local administrative rights. Um, just by all the bones I've already shown. Uh, pretty much, uh, if somebody's able to get a hold of an end user, just to click the wrong place, um, ultimately now you've given that attacker local admin rights on that box, and it's probably only a matter of time before those rights will get elevated. And weak credentials, anywhere from just a password one, company name one, to default account, to no password at all. Uh, again, these are basic principles that still seem to not get fully enforced today. Uh, ways of discovery, uh, standard MAP or vulnerability scans uh, can do a decent job of finding this stuff. Uh, a lot of the vulnerability scanners have um, some minimal lists of default accounts that exist out there for various applications. Um, obviously, just use that, that should just be a starting point. Think about some of the applications that might be in your environment. And go, do, go do your own research. Make sure you're testing for those, for those default accounts. Uh, simple browsing, again, looking past the AD and 443, see if you can find JMX consoles somewhere or, or what have you. Uh, Google, um, a simple Google search, looking for uh, known web application consoles. Uh, if Google's indexed it, more than likely, it means it's probably either got it, it's more than likely not even password protected and just sitting out there. And again, various specialty tools and scripts that are available uh, that can identify or exploit some of these vulnerabilities. Uh, simple web search, I was looking for a desktop web application. Um, more than likely, any of these would be uh, only protected by a password. One of these happen to be in your environment, uh, if some, and somebody's able to compromise an account, ultimately you've now got access to uh, whatever internal resource this is associated with. Uh, SNMP public, mentioned that earlier. Uh, again, key aspect here, out on the perimeter. Um, if, so at least, so now the attacker assessor would have access to information regarding that device, now would potentially give them uh, information regarding other means of attacks, or better yet, if the right community strings were also the default, now they might be able to uh, potentially uh, modify that device. RSH, old school shell, out on the perimeter network, by default does not require a password. Um, so I'm sure it did not take long before somebody owned this box. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Tomcat, mentioned a number of times, very easy to exploit. Uh, if you can either A, find one that has a default password, no password, or a, a version that has the uh, known authentication bypass flaw uh, by default, 
uh, very easily upload a WAR file, which would now give uh, an attacker assessor but, uh, access to uh, system access to that device. Um, depending on the rights of the app, of, of how, depending on the app, the account that Comcat was running as would uh, ultimately give full access to the machine. Uh, default Cisco account. Uh, this, I believe, was a VPN device, um, but kind of case in point here, uh, Cisco device out on the perimeter network with a default account. Uh, if it happened to be a router or whatever, what have you, um, could potentially give uh, not only uh, potentially compromise the network, but ultimately might be able to give access to additional resources in inside the network. LM authentication. Still exists today. Um, for the most part, most environments, I, I can't imagine why LM authentication would still be required. Uh, obviously, 2003, 2008, now 2012, no longer needed, but yet it still exists in the environment or environments that we've seen. So, uh, case study. So, the next few slides was uh, actually regarding an, uh, an engagement I was working on while I was trying to pull this all together. And it just so happened that the, the vulnerabilities and or exploits that I used during this engagement kind of fell in line with what I was talking about today. Um, pretty much um, using most of the vulnerabilities I've already talked about, I was able to, from the perimeter, gain domain admin domain administrative rights within the environment. So it started with a user enumeration flaw. They had a uh, password reset functionality um, and ultimately using the one of the uh, web forms was able to identify a number of accounts that were valid within the application. From there, they had a password reset function and I ultimately tried to find a weak password with one of the accounts that I had, and ultimately one had a password of company name one. Just so happened, they also had a Citrix environment that was only protected by a password. There was no second factor. Uh, once I got in the application, there were three web apps uh, available inside. They did their due diligence in the sense of when you clicked on any of those applications, uh, it would open the browser in kiosk mode. But if you right clicked on any of the links, it did open a new window, uh, you ultimately got a web browser that had a full URL bar. Type in C colon, uh, I now had access to Windows Explorer, uh, browsed over System32 and now had access, uh, command line access to the box. So I figured, all right, it can't be this easy. Um, but it was. I uh, was able to now browse over to my lab machine, downloaded a interpreter shell, and was ultimately sitting on the box in a interpreter shell. And it just so happened that this user also had uh, local admin rights on the Citrix server. Once I got that far, realized that there was a domain admin also available on this box. Uh, I ultimately assumed his token and now had domain administrator privileges in the environment. Uh, I was also able to access internal resources from this box. Uh, obviously at this point I would probably have access to most all of the Windows environment. But to take it one step fur further, if you're not familiar with a tool called Mimikatz, Mimikatz exploits a flaw in the LSAS process which will ultimately dump passwords of those that have been logged in in plain text. So not only did I get the original password I had, but also the domain admin password, but there were about 19 other people that were logged in this server that now I had their passwords in plain text. So, obvious conclusion. Um, do some homework, outside. look outside the box. Uh, just because it says low or medium on a vulnerability scan doesn't necessarily mean it's not gonna potentially lead to a compromise. Um, <coughs> training, um, and this would go just outside of the standard security awareness training. Um, I, I can't count how many times I've heard, I can't believe, or I never thought that an application could do that or whatever have you. Um, basically, we need to get people in IT to start looking outside the box as to 
what can and can't done, be done with an application um, and, and try to start hitting some of this, get rid of some of this crap. It, it shouldn't be here at this point. Questions, comments, concerns? Who's Tom at Timo? I saw that from the screenshot. You don't need to ask, do you? Yeah. <laughs> that would be himself. Well, thank you. Appreciate it.